Raul Corner is an Australian professional basketball head coach with experience in many clubs around the world. He is the current head coach of Medi Baruth of the German Basketball Bundesliga, BBL, where he has been the head coach since 2016. Prior to coaching in Germany, Corner won the Dutch Basketball League and the Dutch Basketball League Coach of the Year Award. And Corner is also the Austrian men's national team head coach. He has had success building clubs, sustaining clubs, and taking clubs to the next level. And we're excited today to be able to talk to him. Coach Corner, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, it's wonderful to talk to you and uh, followed your career. And you've had a lot of success, as I said in the opening, uh, building and sustaining and taking clubs to the next level. And uh, one thing I got to start with here is that uh, you've been with Medi since 2016. And I got to think that's rare, that long time success at the one club. Yes, I guess it is. I, I think it really is. I mean, for me, when you follow my career, and it's been 22 years, if I'm not mistaken now, in, in professional business, I've always stayed between two and five years. So five years was my longest so far. That was in, in Wels, my last station in Austria. Uh, two years was my shortest. So I was very fortunate to stay at least two years wherever I worked. And maybe will be my sixth year now. So uh, it's kind of a new experience also for me. Uh, and as you said, it's, it's rare, uh, but I'm very, I'm very fortunate to be in a good situation and work with good people. And that always helps. Well, yeah, again, it proves that you've had success and you certainly have had success in one of the top leagues in Europe. And uh, I also heard you say a quote once that was development happens outside of your comfort zone. And that really is representative of your career in some ways that you've taken some risks to be able to leave a good situation to try and, again, up level your career. Yes, that's um, first of all, I would say that uh, my career went in, in small steps. Um, I never did like huge steps and and that's probably why i'm in this business for 22 or 23 years now um and i always had a clear vision of where i wanted to be uh, i value good situations there's no question about this but i also understand that as you said if you want to take a next step if you want to develop uh, you have to jump out of your comfort zone uh, that's not always easy because um, I left very good situations. I left situations where I worked with excellent people, where I felt really comfortable. And that was exactly what I actually tried to avoid, to get too comfortable uh, in certain spots. Because if, if you fall in a, in a comfort zone, uh, that's never very beneficial uh, to success. Uh, not as a coach, not as an athlete. Uh, I think you have to kind of always keep that uh, little... Uh, yeah, uh, motivation, something that triggers you, something that, that gives you uh, a new look at, at situations or, or just gives you a new uh, impulse. Uh, and uh, whenever I felt it was time to move on, uh, I moved on. And then it didn't matter if I already had something or didn't have anything yet. I uh, just believed in good things to happen. And uh, so far, it worked out. It definitely has worked out and it's, it's great for coaches uh, to, you know, who are interested in moving up in prof the profession to look at your career and just see, as you said, these, these marginal movements or these marginal gains that have led to long-term success. And, uh, you know, basketball is basketball, you've said, which basically means you have to have to overperform wherever you coach. Can you talk about some of the keys to overperforming wherever you coach? Well, first of all, uh, you're going to face different situations. You're going to have experienced players. You're going to have very young players. You're going to be in a, in a spot or in a situation where uh, management expects you to win the title. Uh, then you'll be in a situation where management just expects you to stay in the league. Um, so it doesn't really matter what situation you're in. Uh, there's always one thing that every situation wants from you. That's basically overperform. So what does that mean? That basically means uh, they want more results than they put in. So... Um, they want to be in a, in a better ranking than your budget will allow you. Uh, in, in basketball terms, uh, I could say that one times five uh, needs to be more than five times one. So the, the, the sum of the parts needs to be worth more than, than all the uh, ingredients. And, and that's basically what it, what it comes down to. You, you just got to find a way uh, to make sure that the, the team functions, that, that everybody buys into that one common goal uh, and in order to do so, you got to make sure that you help each and every player to reach his individual goals. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So that's always a, a very small line. You just you just try to uh, to do more than than people think you're you're capable of doing with with what you have, 
Um, and of all those different situations um, and all the successful teams I have coached, I basically just found three things that those teams had in common. Uh, and there was number one, a very high level of self-discipline. Um, so successful teams always had very self-disciplined players. You didn't need uh, too many rules. You didn't need a rule book uh, like this. You didn't need uh, to punish uh, uh, players uh, every day for being late or anything. Uh, uh, successful teams didn't have that. You didn't have to fight them all the time. So that was number one. Number two was very good team chemistry. Um, I find that, first of all, it's much more fun. Uh, to come to work and, and work with good people who you like to be around. And um, if, if everything is clicking and, and guys are enjoying what they're doing, um, then they can do this successfully. So um, I don't believe in the term that every team needs an asshole. <laughs> so I know this is, this is very common. Uh, I always say, hey, if this team needs an asshole, uh, that's my job. I'll, I'll do it if, if necessary. Um, but uh, I'd rather have good people around me, people I, I trust and people uh, who I can go to war with. Um, and the third thing uh, of those three ingredients uh, is good internal leadership. Um, so um, having at least one player on the team who takes responsibility, who feels responsible for team success, and who basically uh, helps you to transfer your work into the locker room. Uh, so only those three things. Uh, so uh, discipline, like intrinsic motivation, discipline, um, the, the, the good team chemistry and the, and the um, internal leadership. Those are the only three things that all my teams had in common if they were successful. Uh, everything else was different. Sometimes they were more athletic, sometimes less athletic. Sometimes they had more basketball IQ, sometimes less. Sometimes they were favorites, sometimes they were underdogs. Um, only those three things all successful teams had in common. Well, that's great. I'm so grateful you shared that with us. And, and no doubt that reflects back to your values as well as a coach and, and what, what you value in terms of your team and obviously recruitment of players and everything that goes with it. And uh, it builds into us talking a little bit of technical, tactical and philosophy around uh, two topics, which we don't cover enough. And uh, I'm excited to talk. Let's first get into some aggressive switching defense and then solving the resulting mismatches. Maybe let's start with the defensive side. What are you seeing on the defensive side in terms of the best practices with switching? Well, first of all, I think the modern tendency goes towards uh, very versatile players, athletic players, players who are long, who can cover a lot of, a lot of ground. Uh, and with that comes the possibility to switch. So, of course, you need the, you need the personnel to do so. Um, you always have those tendency in basketball. No? They're uh, like the, the positions we had 15 years ago don't exist anymore. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, a three-man would be a four-man in today's game. Uh, the five men of 15 years ago doesn't exist anymore uh, in basketball right now. That doesn't mean that it won't come back. It's just, uh, it's a tendency, uh, tendency right now. Um, but one of the modern tendencies is, is, is switching. So um, what, what you're trying to do with, with switching? Well, first of all, you're, you're trying to, uh, to be aggressive and stay aggressive. You're trying to um, avoid uh, helping in too much. You try to, to, to stay aggressive and st keep uh, pick and roll situations, especially in, in two and two, if somehow possible, because teams have become really good at passing the ball against different uh, pick and roll coverages. So if you head shot hard, uh, they hit you on the short roll or they hit ahead with a quick hit ahead pass and they create an advantage early in the offense. And as, as soon as you have an advantage in offense, if you just have the correct spacing and good ball movement, it, eventually it's going to lead to a high percentage shot. So with switch defense, you try to avoid that um, that that early advantage uh, unless you want to attack in one on one situation. Uh, so so now you have basically two mismatches you have to solve. You have the uh, the big guy against the guard, uh, probably on top of the key if it was a high pick and roll, and you have a, a mismatch under the basket. Um, and if you have the length to cover it one-on-one, -on -one, then maybe you don't even have to do anything. Uh, usually that's, that's not going to happen. But one thing you've already achieved, you, um, you take away uh, the ball movement from, from the offense. You force the offense to, to attack in certain areas and certain spots that you decide uh, where you want them to attack because they only have two advantages. No? It's, it's the big against small or small against big. Um, and, uh, yeah, then, then it starts from there. Then you have to make your mind up. Okay. Um, how can you solve the, the big guy against the guard? Uh, what do you want to do? Do you uh, play the scouting report and say, okay, he's a shooter. So I go, I'm going to make him drive or, uh, he's a driver. So I just want to make him shoot over, 
uh, over a hand that could result into an offensive rebound. That could be a problem for you since your big man is covering the shooter now and you have the mismatch under the basket. Um, or um, do you want to trap it out? Um, so we, what we like to do is if, if we see that um, and we, we switch early, let's say we switch early in, in, in the offense um, or in, in the defensive possession from our perspective, um, that we try to, to trap out uh, the mismatch even uh, outside. So we go from the two-man side, uh, still have a, a side where you have two offensive players uh, and therefore also two defensive players. You just attack uh, with from the two-man side uh, on the first dribble. So you force the defense towards the two-man side and, and attack him. Uh, and that way, just try to put some stress uh, on, on the defense or on the offense. Um, and Co- regarding Coach, the just on that topic, is that, a, yeah. is that a soft trap or a more aggressive no, that would trap? Be, no, that would be a very aggressive trap, okay. um, especially playing the angles, because you don't want the, the offense to make a sophisticated read and you don't want the other players to, to adjust. Um, so we would, we would really attack him. So the, so the guy, the big guy guarding the ball uh, would force the, the offensive player towards the two-man side. And as soon as he takes that first dribble into that direction, enters kind of the danger zone. So an area where he could uh, become a, a, a shooting threat. Uh, we would run the second guy at him and be so aggressive with his hands that he can, um, on one hand, distract the, uh, the driving lane, but on the other hand, also uh, make the, the pass to the next guy very difficult because you need to rotate up. And then uh, on the pass, we would rotate the big man back to his original assignment. So we would try to buy some time with this trap to have the big man run back to his man and rotate out on, on, on the other guys. Well, I'm glad you're covering this because I think that is the next level that we're talking about is how coaches are now going to do different things to be able to distort the advantages that teams have and rotating and trapping and different things like that uh, are obviously a big part of it. I'm also curious, you talked about the big forcing towards the two side. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you have any other rules for the big in terms of obviously you don't want them to give up the three, you'd rather have the drive? Well, depending on the scouting report, if you have a a non-shooter, I, I give him the shot. You just got to make sure that you cover the rebounding situation uh, because even if he misses, um, you're going to have a hard time to, to get the defensive rebound because you have another mismatch under the basket. So that, that's an issue. Um, uh, the, the main rule for the big men is to really be uh, aggressive. So uh, to, 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 when you go out in the switch, uh, it's like a hard hedge. Uh, so you take away this initial momentum because you don't want the guard being able to attack the big downhill. Uh, that's one of the most difficult things for, for big men to, to stop is if they're attacked in full speed situation by, by a guard. So we want to still hedge out parallel to the sideline and hedge out aggressively. Um, and as soon as the, the guard retreats, then we get under the ball um, so that we stop this first initial initial attack. That's, that's the main thing. And then, of course, using uh, arms and hands um, to make the first pass out uh, a slow uh, and uh, yeah, be difficult. Well, I like this because you've given the solution already, and that's the problem with obviously gapping a non-shooter is that you're giving them space to build up speed to attack you. But what you're saying is you're immediately rotating from the two side to be able to take that advantage away, anyways. Uh, and are there certain players where you won't rotate and trap, also based on scout? Well, uh, there you sometimes you have guards who are excellent pick and roll players, so they really pick apart the defense and they read. Well, it's a soft hedge. I just keep the defender on my back and make the right play. So they're very good as soon as they have created that advantage, but they're not good advantage creators one on one, regardless if it's a, a small guy or a big. Uh, in that case, uh, I would leave them with the big guy, and I would leave them in a one-on-one situation against the big, the big challenging or contesting the shot, of course, so always with his hand up and uh, staying in the line, ball and basket to, to not getting attacked uh, or, or beat by the, uh, by, the, by the ball handler so he can at least contest the, the shot, maybe block the shot. Um, so that could be a situation where I say, okay, hey, let's, let's have him create one-on-one because that's not what he's known for. Yes, there are certain situations. That's great to hear. And uh, so then let's deal with the uh, small on the big. Are you triple switching? Are you scramming at the rim? What are you trying to do in terms of that? Or are you just keeping them there and having them aggressively defend? Yes, triple switching is, is one solution if possible. Um, so we would always, usually when we're in a hard hedge situation, we help from the two-man side. So the baseline man would cover the, uh, the roll-off and uh, protect and then rotate out. If, if we have the chance to 
uh, to triple switch this, the last man being uh, the, the, let's say, four men, uh, uh, then it would be easy. We, we're just on the, we're protecting the, the five, the rolling five men now with the, with the defensive four men, and we just rotate the five men uh, through, uh, if, if possible, uh, to the, uh, on the first pass uh, out to the, to the four men. So that could be, that could be an option. Um, if it's not possible, then we would just trap on the catch. So we would try to front. Uh, stay in contact. I think that's one of the most important things that the, the guard always keeps contact with the big and tries to push him low, low, low. Um, and uh, as, as always stays in the, in the passing lane and the, the guy from the, from the two man side, the last man uh, just attacks the big man on the catch basically and tries to force the pass out. And then the guard rotates out and we try to get back into our original assignments. Dive in a little deeper with the detail then, uh, the importance of the two side and then the spacing of those two help defenders. Do you want the one in and one out? And is that based on who they're covering or is that based on their positioning? They're, they're zoning up. If, if you decide to triple switch, it makes sense to uh, switch onto the roll man from the bigger guy. Uh, yeah. So you would zone up and have the, uh, have the, the, the bigger guy uh, picking up the, the roll man. Um, so get into a zone up. Uh, situation like this uh, forehand. Um, you could also decide if, if the shooters are really dangerous or more dangerous than the big men uh, to just keep it two and two and stay with the shooters. Because what you originally want to uh, uh, or want to avoid uh, by switching uh, is, is the rotations, right? From the shooters, you want to stay with the shooters and basically keep this two and two. Um, if you now start triple switching and rotating, you actually, again, giving up uh, some, some passing to, to the shooters. If you want to avoid this, you just keep it two and two. Don't triple switch. Uh, fake in, but stay with the shooter. So you're, you're back out uh, on the pass out. You arrive with the pass and, and, and contest the shot. Um, so you, you really have to, and that really depends on what you're trying to do as a, as a coach and what you're trying to destroy from the offense. Do you want to destroy um, the, the, the advantage uh, creating for shooters? Uh, or are you more concerned of the big man or the guard creating a mismatch? Well, again, it all starts from this position of understanding what's going to get you beat. If we're going to get beat, this is what's going to happen. And then that, that philosophy dictates everything from there. So this is really cool to hear. Other part then with switching is, are you seeing a lot of off the ball switching? Uh, my view of Europe is that you're seeing a lot more off the ball switching because they tend to situationally deny more where someone's trying to force a play higher or even deny a matchup, the ball in their spot. Are you seeing that a lot more too? That really depends. Um, I think you see right now, you see a lot of very compact defenses. So instead of being on the line and up as it used to be, uh, I would say 10 years ago, five to 10 years ago, uh, a lot of teams will play uh, in the passing lane, one, one foot uh, or the upside foot on the line uh, of the, 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 a player and the and the ball and and thumb down you know all those those things that you that you learned back in the days from Dick Bennett and in, in his uh, defensive um, assignments um, people tend to get away from this uh, and just play in, in flat triangle position an open stand situation and and deny like this you don't deny anymore uh, with with your shoulder in the passing lane you deny more in open stands uh, forming a flat triangle stunt with the closer hand to the basketball stunt towards the ball and the other hand uh, always being able to deflect uh, a pass uh, to to the next guy so so that's a tendency you see uh, what you mentioned the, the deny and forcing out yes um, that happens usually to uh, delay or destroy entry passes so you can see that uh, if, if a specific play is designed to get the shooter open in a certain spot or to, to make an entry pass to a certain spot, um, then you see the denial. Uh, but um, a lot of times you see teams play very compact, not caring so much about you moving the ball, but just making sure that they protect the lane. And every time the ball gets put on the floor, whether it's a guard or a big man, you get a second hand uh, towards the ball and everything looks really narrow. So you have no more space to really attack or dribble drive. Well, and what all this leads to, of course, is discussing now the other side of the ball, which is how do you solve all this on offense? What are, what are some of the things that you do to be able to solve uh, the, the challenge of attacking switches? Well, um, now you have to see totally from, from the opposite uh, perspective, because again, you have two mismatches now in your advantage and um, it, it all depends on your personnel. Um, for me, whether I'm offense or defense, 
I always try to be in charge of the situation. So when I'm on defense, I want to determine uh, what options the offense has to solve certain situations. And the same thing is when I'm on offense. I don't want the defense to tell me what I want to do. I, I, I want to be in charge. I want to be. I want to drive the car. I want to. I want to be on the on the steering wheel. Um, so um, if if we want to attack, uh, the, the first thing always is the quick quick pass to the roll man. Uh, that's that's always. Uh, a good look if, if you have it there, if the, the you know that the defense is going to switch a ball screen, uh, you might just want to slip this. Uh, and, and instead of uh, setting the screen, you just slip the screen and hit him with a quick pass. A lot of times the, the problem is already solved. Against good defense, it's not going to happen, but still you might get one or two possessions a game like this. Um, so uh, if, if you have a good aggressive defense on you and you couldn't make the first pass, this would be my first look. Look at the, look at the big man. Look at the roll-off right away. Uh, the next thing for me would be the hit ahead pass. Uh, you hit ahead. You, you hit the, the next guy um, quickly uh, and have him look inside. So, so he then looks for, for the big who seals his man uh, tries to to work around, tries to get deep position. I think that's one of the most common mistakes big men tend to do, that they roll right to the block, whereas they should try to get open right under the basket. They shouldn't need a dribble uh, because if, if they need a dribble, they give the, the smaller guards a chance to collapse or even double team them. Uh, so they should try to get deep position, get their arms up, uh, try to seal the, the defender right behind them and, and, and show a high target, whereas the Mismatch pass always needs to be a high pass, so uh, we don't want any low passes against uh, against switching defense. Um, so that's the that's the next look. Uh, you look for the direct pass. If they front, uh, we would bring the 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 weak side baseline man, uh, flash him high for the high low pass. So this will be the second look to attack inside. And if all this uh, doesn't happen or we don't want to attack inside, that's also possible because maybe we have a big man who's not very good catching the ball against uh, a physical guard or uh, we, we see more advantage from, from the outset, then we would get the pass back to the point guard who in the meantime gets open and now clear out the space and have the guard attack. So he would come back um, to really, he can go far back because a lot of times the big man try to, to deny this, uh, this pass back. Uh, so uh, drag the big man out and then go downhill and attack your man. And then, of course, find a solution because you're not going to be under the basket by yourself. You can see a collapsing defense or somebody's going to help. So you got to make a good decision once you beat your man. Um, another thing is when you attack from top of the key uh, against the big, uh, and even if you're not a great one-on-one -on -one player, you still have the option on the two-man side uh, to set the screen for hammer action to create a, an open shot for a good shooter. So you draw the attention of the defense by attacking the big um, and have a hammer action set uh, on the two-man side towards the better shooter. So this can be a flare screen up or this can be a down screen, depending on where the better shooter is. And that way, give the ball handler two options. So you can attack and look for finish or you can look for the, look for the shooter. So this would be my checklist or our checklist uh, to attack this mismatch. It's great. Uh, coaches are loving this. Uh, there's no doubt they're writing down those things. And uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper on a few of them, especially in the, the, the ghost timing or the slip timing. Can you talk a little bit about what you're teaching your players on these ghost screens in terms of uh, when they release and what type of positioning they, they open to? The main um, focus on every offense, no matter what you run, is creating an advantage. Um, so you create your advantage uh, once you manage to draw a second defender on the ball. And whenever this happens, um, the action starts. Um, so that, that starts, you have to set up your man in order to use the screen. If you're not using the screen, the defense doesn't have to help. They don't have to switch. They don't have to hedge. You create no advantage. The screen was for nothing. Uh, so I think this is very important to understand. A lot of times, uh, this is where the problem starts. You don't create an advantage initially. Uh, because you're executing sloppily. So you have to be ready to really set a screen. But uh, if the defense wants to be proactive um, and, and wants to be a, a little smart ass and, and be ahead of the action, and they call out switch before anything happens, um, then the advantage is actually already there because your defender, from the big man's perspective, uh, is already... Uh, getting ready to stop the ball and to, to concentrate on the ball handler. And in this moment, there's no more need to set any screen because the advantage is already there. Then you start the action, so you're going. So that's basically the, uh, the timing. Um, on, the down, on the other side, that's what we tell our, our defensive players. You don't switch on calls. You don't switch on demands. It shouldn't be necessary to call out a switch. You switch when you uh, crash into the screen. <laughs> if there's no contact, there's no need to switch. 
Uh, if, if, if there's a sloppy screen set, uh, be ready to switch. But if there's no advantage, you don't need to switch. And you can see on, on very high level uh, that players, and as much as we coaches love communication, but at high level, players don't need to hear screen left, screen right. They don't care. They play their men one-on-one. -on -one. They don't get beat. They play them straight up. And if there's a screen coming, they know somebody's going to help them. But they need to fight over the screen anyway. Uh, and when we switch, we usually switch over. So we don't go under the roll-off guy. We switch over the guy and push him down, push him low. Also for reason of switching back if the ball handler comes back. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if you can imagine this, but you attack against the hard hedge. The big man is hedging out. So what are you doing? You're coming back the other direction, right? But now if you're switching over that screen, the guard can pick you right back up and the big man can switch back and nothing happens. Yeah, so we want to switch over anyway. So if we go hard hedge, we go over. If we go, um, if we go in in soft hedge, we fight over the screen. So it doesn't matter. Um, you want to fight over the screen, and if there's no switch, you still fight over. So uh, from the defensive perspective, uh, no contact, no switch, uh, and no contact, no uh, no disadvantage from from our side. Then we don't need to help. And from the offensive perspective, as soon as you have that, uh, that that advantage, as soon as you see that the defense reacts and gives you an advantage, boom, go from that moment on. So there's no rule where you say, okay, you have after the first dribble, after the second dribble. No, it really depends on when the defense reacts and how the defense reacts. So the other advantage of over the screen, the switch, is that the guard, when they recover, are going to be on top of the big already. Is that another part yes. of that, that when they recover Absolutely. back to the big? Plus the triple switch is easier, right? Much if easier. you imagine a horn situation uh, and you're caught below the big man, how do you want to switch out uh, on the guard? Yeah, so uh, the big man is going to get covered by the next guy uh, from, from the baseline and you want to rotate out and triple switch towards the, the next outside player, you're going to be stuck under the big and he might seal you or, or turn this into a screen. If you're on top of him, uh, all the offense can do now is lob the ball uh, over you towards the rim uh, and this is where you hopefully have the last man covering for you. I am so glad you said the part about communication. And I, I say this all the time, that communication is overrated on defense. And what's more important is individual player decision-making. And the reality is the decision happens well, you know, in, in a completely different way than the communication. And that's what you highlighted. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of coaches probably cringing when you said that, but it's so true, isn't it? And I just want you to restate that too, that your emphasis is on players covering their individual matchup, which is, to say, don't rely on your help, rely on your individual defense until you know otherwise. Help is plan B. Uh, help is always plan B. Plan A is stop your man. Um, because as soon as you need to rotate, um, you have potential mistakes. Uh, if, if, if you stop your man one-on-one, -on -one, if you don't need a help, um, then, hey, uh, that's how it should be. It's like uh, when you're, you're, you're uh, balancing uh, on a rope, uh, over uh, on a, from one mountain to the other, right? You, you, you have to drop and you balance from one mountain to the other. It's great to have a safety net under you, uh, but you're not planning on using it. Uh, it the, the trick is to, to get from A to B on the drop without needing the safety net beneath you, right? So it's the same on defense. It's great that the safety net is there, but you don't want to use it. Yeah, uh, you want to uh, stay in front of your man, and if somehow possible, avoid all type of rotations. It it helps you in rebounding. It helps you uh, in 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 misunderstandings or avoiding misunderstandings and all this. So this is uh, at the end of the day, basketball is very simple. Uh, the hardest thing in basketball is to keep it simple, uh, and and especially for us coaches uh, to to not make it too complicated. Um, stop your man one on one. Uh, if you can't for whatever reason, you're going to have help. But your first focus is not on using help. Uh, one more aspect to the communication part. Don't get me wrong. I love communication and I, I, I want players to communicate, but I want them to rely on it and I don't want them to use it as an excuse. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, think about it in Germany, once hopefully COVID is, is, is finished, uh, you play in, in, in gyms uh, that sit between, uh, I would say, three and a half thousand and 15,000 people. So now you play in, let's say, in Bayreuth you know, to take our spot. Uh, you might have 4,000 people there in, in a very small gym, but they all go nuts. Uh, you're not going to hear switch or screen right, screen left. There's no way. You don't hear it. Uh, so all the communication is nice for practice. It's nice for, uh, for, for getting used to each other, uh, but you won't hear those things. Uh, now you did uh, because you, you heard everything uh, in the gym. Um, but in a full gym, in the heat of the moment, you don't hear those things. And um, that's why you shouldn't rely on it.
Well, and it speaks to basketball is a visual cue game, not a verbal cue game in terms of decision making. And uh, that's a big part. I, I want to just come back to uh, defending the ghost screen because you talked about the, the player on the ball staying connected, but equally important. And I want you to address this because you did, but I just want to make sure coaches catch it is the player on the ball. Like part of the reason of this ghost or this slip screen is that the defender on the ball has turned their feet and started to force the ball into the help. And now the help's right. not there. Can you talk about right. that part of this? Well, you stay straight up. You play your man straight up um, uh, until you know uh, that you're on the same page with with your other player. Now, if if you wanna uh, if you wanna go hard in, for hard hedge defense and uh, or you wanna trap, um, and uh, you know that at the end of the day you wanna force the guy into the screen, um, then you will force him that direction. You just don't let him go the other side, but then you got to make sure that your help is there. It's the same if you if you go in ice uh, defense or blue or however you want to call this, and you force the man away from the screen. You better make sure uh, that the driving lane is covered by the big. So this is this is timing, um, and basically the uh, the 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 big uh, sees how the guard is lined up. The, the guard doesn't see, the guard is focused on the ball. He doesn't see where the screen is coming and there's nothing I hate more than guards looking left, right to watch where the screen is coming. It doesn't matter where the screen is coming, stop your man, right? And the big man then is gonna take care uh, of, of any type of problems that might, might occur resulting uh, from, from the screening action. So uh, don't open a lane uh, before you're not hundred percent sure that the big man covers you or that he's there. Uh, if you're not sure, play your man straight up um, and, uh, yeah, uh, don't rely on, 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 on help, uh, one-on-one -on -one responsibility. Well, this is great. And I'm glad we got there. And I know you gave some other points. I want to get to the, one of the other ones that you mentioned too, which is this early ball movement, you know, to be able to move it, to be able to attack before the, essentially the player recovers to the big on the roll and this type of thing. I think in the NBA, they call it when it's an off the ball situation, a stampede, which is there's yeah. early help. And then you can picture someone like James Harden, just immediately they see the early help. They're passing it to the player one pass away because they've got the advantage. So you did your job. Yes. Same philosophy here in terms of that, correct? Yes. Uh, again, it comes down to creating an advantage. And the advantage is there if the second defender is focusing on the ball. And from that moment on, if you have good spacing, you know, that's, uh, that's a must. If you don't have good spacing, uh, you're not going to create an advantage, even if you set a good screen. But if you have good spacing, all you need now is to move the ball and to move it quickly. And uh, there, I think the most difficult part is to convince the players of the, making the simple pass and not looking for the touchdown pass. So you want to make you want to make the the next open pass, and and this will lead uh, to a good situation. It may not lead to the it may not be an assist. Uh, it may not even be the hockey assist, but it, it's going to get the advantage going. You, you want to keep the advantage alive, as we say. Uh, and from that moment on, it just depends on okay, where is the best shooter. Um, who has a closeout that he, uh, that he can attack? Uh, where do you have uh, maybe someone cutting to the basket? All that is is then your automatics uh, when you when you have a, a mismatch. That depends on philosophy, on the spacing you have. Do you have uh, one big man or do you play uh, with with two bigs? Uh, so you don't have a shooting four. You you're gonna have two bigs inside. Spacing is more difficult. So you're gonna have different different rules. But the key thing is to get rid of the ball, even though it's not spectacular. Oh, that's great. And that, that connects back to obviously the three, three things you mentioned earlier, especially team chemistry, where your players have to be willing to do the simple things to be able to help the team and uh, such a great example there. Uh, I know we're going to go to one of the other areas, which uh, we're going to talk about and probably doesn't get enough attention. And uh, it's such a big part of modern basketball. And that's these post automatics and using the low post in modern basketball. Can you talk about some of the best practices that you've found in terms of that? Well, first of all, as, as modern as the switching is nowadays, um, as uh, underused, in my opinion, uh, are post-up situations uh, nowadays. And again, that goes with just trends in, in basketball. Um, I think uh, a lot of those trends come from the NBA. If you have successful teams who have five shooters on the court who all can stretch the floor uh, and who win NBA championships, uh, then other teams try to copy this and, and all of a sudden you don't have a a big man anymore and, and then when you have a guy like Jokic uh, on the team all of a sudden you have a skilled big man who can pass the ball uh, then the tendency goes towards using the big as kind of a, a, a point center um, so those tendencies come and go but uh, in my personal philosophy I think a post-up is always a, a good 
uh, opportunity to get the ball close to the rim. I mean, you can, uh, penetration is, uh, can be a dribble penetration, but it can also be a passing penetration. So you, you basically attack the defense uh, in their heart. You, you get the ball close to the rim. The defense has to react. They have to, have to collapse and got to do something. So uh, plus the, the most high percentage three-point shots are inside-out shots. And this can come from penetration, so driving kick. Uh, or this can come from pass inside and pass outside. Uh, and statistically, those are the most high percentage shots. So we try to get those type of shots. Not always you have a, a big man who's, or anybody who is very good with his back to the basket. For me, post-up doesn't mean it's the center. Post-up can be the point guard. Uh, maybe the point guard is not a great back to the basket one-on-one -on -one player, but maybe he's a great passer out of this area. So we get him into that spot. But then it's just important that all the other guys know what they're doing. Um, so that then has to do with the personnel you have and so on. But I think it's very important to have clear um, understanding of all five players. If we get the ball to the post, no matter if it's the one, two, three, four or five, um, and no matter when that is, uh, it's, if it's early in the offense or late in the offense, uh, what do I do? Uh, what do I have to do? And how do I uh, try to create an advantage? Here we go again. <laughs> I have again the advantage. How to create that advantage for, my, for myself or my teammates? So what have you found? Have you probably tried both in terms of like there's a set reaction versus there's decisions that players make? And uh, what are you currently using? And then what have you found is, is the advantages of both? Well, we're, we're giving the players a, a checklist. Once they catch the ball inside, um, the first thing they look for is the quick move situation. So uh, if you catch the ball inside the paint, uh, we stay away from cutting and, and anything uh, that could narrow the defense, uh, that could bring the defense towards the ball too much. So if we have a chance for a quick move, there could be a mismatch. Uh, there could be a guy uh, being under the basket in the three-second lane. Um, that could be a clear... Uh, seal situation where he just needs a quick drop step to, to score. Uh, if we have a quick move situation, there's no cutting, no screening, nothing, and we just space out. So that's number one. Number two, if you catch the ball in the post and you don't have a quick move, you wait for the cutting action. Uh, um, on, on, on this cutting action, we have a clear assignment. Um, if we post up the five, we'll have the four men uh, screen for the, for the passer uh, who can then decide to cut baseline or use this, use this screen. Uh, as a flare cut for shot or curl to, towards the basket. Um, if we post up the four men, this would be the five men. So if we post up anybody but the, uh, but the five men, actually, this would be the five men setting that screen. Uh, and from that action on, uh, the whole thing starts. So this can result in cuts. This can result in staggered screens for shooters coming off. This can result in back screens. Uh, we have a lot of options out of this. We have a lot of... Uh, uh, yes, rules out of it, but I'm 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 not a fan of robotic basketball. So I like to give the players a, um, a, an amount of options uh, and a, an amount of reads, uh, and give them the tools to solve the problems that the defense might throw on us. Uh, so um, we give them different options, and we want the players to make reads out of those out of those situations. Uh, so that would be the second thing. Now the quick move, then you have all the cut and, and fill. Um, and if we don't get anything out of the cuts, I, I don't want the, the, the post player to dribble into the cutting action. Uh, this is where turnovers usually uh, happen. Um, so he waits for all those cuts and then he goes to work in one-on-one -on -one situation. Then we have other cuts uh, that, we, that we have, other rules that we have once the big man uh, attacks. So we'll space out, we'll, we'll use the, the weak side uh, for some hammer action, um, just depending on the, on the personnel. I just think that the timing is crucial that you don't start too early, that you don't cut into the action, uh, and that you space out once the guy goes one-on-one. -on -one. So what we're saying for basically the post player, but also for the player on the perimeter who may be attacking a switch is it's one-on-one -on -one before it's five-on-five, -five, right? Like they're trying to score one-on-one -on -one before it's five-on-five, -five, but if they don't have a quick score, and I want you to define this for us, what is a quick opportunity to score? Is that a catch and go immediately? And then they pause, if they pause, then there's cutters. How are you defining that for players? Well, it's, uh, first of all, one you mentioned already, if, uh, there's a mismatch. We first tried to get the ball, not to the block, but under the basket. Mm -hmm. That would be a clear 
quick move situation. Uh, um, and and it's basically it's it's reading each other. I mean, you can you can see most players when you see them catch the ball and they get that tunnel vision. And boom! I'm gonna attack. Then it's better to just stay out and give them a, a passing opportunity. But I think that the main thing also here, whether it's a guard or a big, it's it's always the same. Uh, you go for advantages, and as soon as a second player, whether it's a hard stunt or it's double team. Um, when it's, when the second defender comes to you, get rid of the ball. And in order to have an advantage, uh, you need to have good spacing. Um, so for for the, we expect our bigs just as much as we expect our, expect our guards. If there's a second guy coming, get rid of the ball. And if it's an unspectacular pass, it's an unspectacular pass. But get rid of the ball and then we're going to try to, because uh, we have an advantage then, uh, let's try to keep that advantage alive. I think that that's one of the main things. And uh, big men can become very good passers. I mean, we have a very good example with Andy Seifert on our team, a German national team player. Uh, he used to be a, a kind of a black hole. I hope he will. Uh, he will excuse me to, to mention this, but he, he used to be known as a black hole in the post. He's very skilled in the post. And he's a very good one-on-one player. He has a variety of moves and fakes and all that. Uh, but he used to not pass the ball out anymore. And, and in the last couple of years, he developed into one of the best passing big men in, in, in our league, uh, just because he knows uh, when guys are going to cut, where they're going to cut, so he can make the pass before the player even gets there. Uh, and, and, and that helps him that he knows, okay, if, if somebody else is coming, I know exactly um, where the options are going to be. And, and that helped his passing tremendously. And now he, uh, you can see that he, he has fun. Uh, a couple of years ago, he just had fun uh, scoring against this guy. Now he has fun scoring and fun to create a dunk for a cutter, uh, to create an open shot for a shooter. Uh, you can see that he, he, he developed some, some, pri- uh, some pride into, uh, into becoming a great passer. Uh, that's great. Passing is fun. And uh, I'm curious then, are you giving uh, any type of visual cues to cutters in terms of making the decision to cut? You talked about when to cut, obviously based on that quick move or not, but are there other, like who cuts? Is there a visual cue? Like if my defender turns, loses vision, what's happening? Well, we have that, we have that one screener, right. Who will be on the, on the elbow on, on ball side and, and, this first screen will basically just enable the, the passer who passed into the post to, to use this use this screen. And then this, this passer who uses that screen will meet on the other elbow, will meet the second guard. Um, we have a couple, a couple of cues that we, that we give players. First of all, we would like to have the better cutters cut and the better shooters shoot. Uh, it sounds very simple and obvious. Uh, it's not as simple and obvious as it sounds, especially not for players. So, um, that's something where, where you also create team chemistry. You ask, hey, who's the better shooter? And, and 99%, uh, you're going to get the right answer <laughs> or an honest answer from your player. So then, hey, let's get the better shooter to the shooting spot. And let's get the better cutter to the, to the cutter spot. Uh, stuff like this. Or uh, just use some, some, you set a small, small screen there and you have some miscommunication. You would go again to switch. You hear the switch early. So you, instead of setting the screen, you just boom, you just sprint and cut to the basket or you screen your own man. And um, you give the players a lot of options. And I think that's in modern basketball, it's really important to not give the players uh, strict rules. You go from A to B and then you do C, uh, but to give them options and let them operate within the team structure let them be creative. Uh, let them let them think the game because it's a uh, it's it, it's a game. It's it's still uh, it, it shouldn't be uh, following strict um, uh, robotic rules. Uh, it's it's more yes, you have a concept and you you operate within this concept, but within the concept you you need to make reads. You need to adjust to the defense because the defense has unlimited um, unlimited options for you to throw at you, and you have unlimited solutions. Uh, so this is a, a never-ending proce- process, right? You, you see a different defense, you adjust immediately. If you need a timeout every time you see a different defense, uh, you're going to run out of timeouts after the third minute of the game. So um, you need to teach your players how to solve those problems by themselves. And, and that's our main thing as, as coaches, to give them the instruments to solve those problems and then make sure that they make the right decisions. Uh, and then you feel like you're um, indestructible no matter what type of defense you face? What, what is your preferred method to counter a uh, post double uh, if, if those happen? Well, we, we usually it depends on where the double team comes from. It can come from different areas. A lot of teams uh, try to, to attack from the passer. If they see that, that the, the passer always uses the, the screen and, and cuts to the shooter spot, they just attack. Um, some defenses attack on the first dribble. 
uh, uh, double team on the first dribble. So for us, that's no problem because we don't dribble unless we have uh, spacing. No? So we go with quick move, there's no time. Uh, or we have the cutting and there's no dribbling. Uh, and once they uh, start to dribble, then we're spaced out and, and we would just uh, cut the guy um, from uh, where the double team is actually coming from. So uh, usually if it comes from the baseline, and that's very common, uh, the double team comes from the from the weak side, from the deep help man, uh, we'll just cut this guy right behind the double team guy, cut him under the basket. Um, but there's, there's so many things you can do. And that also depends then on personnel. Um, is this guy the double team from? Is he a good shooter? Uh, sometimes they they just double off a weak shooter, so then you cut him. Uh, if they cut, if they double team off a great shooter who's not a great cutter and who, who wouldn't uh, or who would have problems to finish at the rim, we might keep him out and and cut and cut the next guy. So it's very difficult to give you a uh, an answer uh, fitting all uh, all teams. And I don't even know what we're gonna do next year because uh, I haven't seen my team play yet. So we need to see what the personnel looks like and what exactly we're going to do. We're going to have clear rules. Um, that's that's clear, but um, not before I have seen the, the the team and the personnel. Well, I love that you even said that, that you don't know how you're going to play yet because you don't know your team. And I think too many coaches predetermined and you really don't know until you get your team together sometimes, do you? Well, you have to adjust at least. I mean, every coach has his philosophy and uh, most of us, or I would say a good part of us have the, the chance to put the team together that it fits uh, our our philosophy, but sometimes um, you are limited. Uh, you you get a player that you really like who doesn't fit the the profile one hundred percent. You were looking for a more athletic player. Now you're getting a player who's more finesse guy, um, and then you have to use him differently. I mean, I remember I'm, um, I'm I'm I think I'm known as a as a coach who likes structure. Um, as I said, not not stubborn structure, not robotic structure, but discipline that everybody knows his role and so on. My first year in Bayreuth with a guard duel. Uh, with Kean Anderson and, and Trey Lewis, um, who were like loose cannons, <laughs> you know, they they played on such a high energy level um, that it was very difficult to uh, to put them into a into a more restricted uh, system. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to because they functioned the best when they had more freedom. So we played probably wilder than than I ever had imagined I would ever have a team of mine play. Uh, but hey, we finished fourth in the league. We uh, we qualified for the playoffs for the first time in over 20 years in, in, in Bayreuth, which is had a great season. Um, so why would I stop this? You know, just because my my basic idea was something else. Um, hey, just right the wave. If things work, uh, don't mess it up. Sometimes um, we coaches are already successful if the, if we don't fuck it up. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have a if you have a Lamborghini, don't tune it down uh, and make it a Skoda. Uh, let it let it go. Uh, let it run and, 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 and adjust your philosophy. Um, stay true to yourself, but be flexible. Um, if, if you have a goldfish, uh, don't ask him to climb on the tree. Uh, throw him into the water and let him do his thing. Uh, I think that's that's very important. I love it. Uh, it's, is it better to be happy or right? You know, <laughs> comes well, back uh, to that course, sometimes, course. right? <laughs> A yeah. uh, coach wants to be both. <laughs> we do, but happy is better. And the happy usually yeah, means absolutely. you're successful, right? <laughs> absolutely, yes. So that's a great, great example, coach. And I'm curious, then, are you doing anything on set plays, uh, ATOs or specials uh, with, with post entries and specific set actions that you want to do? Yeah, uh, always depending on the on the personnel, of course. I mean, we have a lot of things. We I think we use the post uh a lot compared to other teams in the in the German Bundesliga, um, partly because we have and deciphered and would be a waste if we didn't use him uh, in the post. So we throw the ball into the post and we signed a, a Lithuanian big man, um, Sayus, um, this season still on his way up, a very talented uh, Lithuanian young man um, who's also, um, I think, has the potential to to operate in the in the post probably more than he did in Spain last year. Uh, we'll see how that how that looks and how that goes and if it if it works we're gonna stick to it and if it doesn't work we're gonna do something else <laughs> it's very very simple sometimes uh, you just have to go by trial and error that's why I like to have a, a longer preseason um, that we find out during practices and during the first scrimmage games okay um, what works for us and what doesn't so some some plays that uh, were bread and butter plays for us last season may not even be in our playbook next year because they won't work with the new personnel and some other 
players that we decided to skip last year, we're going to implement next year because the personnel is there. Uh, so philosophy stays the same, personnel changes, and then you have to you have to adjust. Uh, you just I'm I'm not in the position that I can. I can buy the perfect player on each position who can do it all. Uh, that's I'm um, coaching in Bayreuth and not in Barcelona <laughs> or or Moscow or whatever. That, and that's most of us in coaching, isn't it? We just you know um, we have imperfect rosters. <laughs> uh, yes, but we're imperfect coaches as well. No? So Absolutely. we just gotta every every we should. I think that's one of the main things also for us coaches that we don't focus so much of what our players cannot do. Uh, focus on what they can do. Here we go back to the goldfish. No. If, don't don't yell at the goldfish that he is not good at climbing a tree. Um, uh, put him into his comfort spot uh, and and see how beautiful he can swim or or how good he he can do things there. You know, the players are more happy. You're more successful. Don't focus on the weaknesses. Focus on the strengths and use the players to their best abilities. And sometimes we always tell the players to forget their egos and check their egos at the door. The same counts for us coaches. Um, uh, we're not bigger than the team. Um, we're just we're just there to to help the players to look good. Uh, that's that's our main job. So staying on the post stuff, uh, just quickly. Then, what are we teaching? It, it, we're talking about these modern post players. Or what are we teaching? We traditionally teach all these back down and these double pivots and these different types of moves. Uh, are we teaching something different, or is it the same philosophy uh, still is in effect today? No, we're, we're still teaching that, but we're also uh, teaching dribble handoff actions from the post coming out. Uh, I think that's that's important. We're, we're teaching uh, split post actions where they catch it more in mid post and attack facing up. Uh, we're even teaching pick and roll where the post player is a ball handler uh, catching the ball in, in, in low post area or mid post area and the guard all of a sudden comes down and screens for the big man. And the big man uses the guard uh, to, to take a dribble towards the basket. So uh, those are all tendencies that we can use that are used in modern basketball, but it all depends on, on, on the personnel that we, that we have. So there's nothing wrong with uh, the good old skyhook uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar memorial move. Uh, why not? And if you have a guy uh, doing the flamingo shot like Dick Nowitzki used to do it, hey, uh, do it, use it. Um, but it's not going to work for everybody. So I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try to to make Andy Seifert uh, to keep that example uh, to make him into a flamingo shooter. No, um, but he has a very good baby hook. So we use this. We use up and under and all those old fashioned things. I mean, some things still say the same. It's still a basket. It's still a, a round ball. It's still a rim at three meter five. Um, things don't change. And and uh, if if things don't work. Uh, if, if, if things still work, um, why getting away from it? Because they will come back anyway. If, if you're successful uh, with what you're doing, you might be even a trendsetter. So um, do the things that work for you and don't do them just because they're, they're modern and, and uh, they're, they're all vogue. Uh, if they don't work for you, forget it. Um, you might be very successful with uh, old school. So just one example this year in the German league, for example, now you, we all agree that post-up is not very common right now. And we all agree that the mid-range shot has lost uh, importance. Uh, everybody says mid-range shot is the, is the worst shot in basketball. And statistically, it's right. Uh, I don't agree hundred percent because there are situations where you have to be able to shoot a mid-range shot. Otherwise you're not going to be effective. But anyway, um, now the most successful team um, internationally, German team internationally in the last uh, decades was Bayern Munich this year. What did they do offensively? Well, their offense uh, relied on post-up and mid-range game. <laughs> that's that's what they did, basically. Uh, and, and they almost made the EuroLeague Final Four. They were close. They were in Game 5. Um, they dominated the German League and, until the, the finals when they had um, personnel problems. But hey, um, it, it worked for them. And, and yes, then defensively, they were very modern. They, uh, modern, uh, and, uh, they, they, they switched a lot and, and uh, they did what people would consider modern basketball. But hey, um, would you tell Andrea Trinchieri that he played old fashioned basketball just because they used their personnel on offense? No, for them, mid range game and post up was what made them successful. So why, why would you not do it just because it's, it's not modern? Um, so that's just one example, I think. 
Well, great advice on that. And uh, yeah, I could listen to you and Andre talk basketball anytime, coach. It's uh, just fun to be able to hear you. We had Andre on the podcast very early on and uh, just great insights. And uh, you open the door, uh, often called grenade actions, dribble handoffs out of the post. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some, um, some teaching points on that? Because I think a lot of coaches that are seeing it are curious about that. Well, I, I would much rather show you on the court. Yes, <laughs> so would I. <laughs> in this remote setup here. Um, teaching points. I mean, one teaching point is always timing um, on the whole thing. Uh, and of course, then, then technique, individual technique of the post player and how to protect the ball um, to, to uh, get away from his defender with that, with that first dribble to have a little advantage towards the defender in order to, to dribble up. Um, to protect the ball while handing off and then to make in a read, uh, where does the defender of the guard go? Does he go under? Then after the handoff, you have to set a re screen. Um, if the defender chases over, then you have to roll immediately or pop, uh, no matter, or depending on what your, uh, what your profile as a, as a player is, but you have the advantage already. So uh, you're, again, you're trying to create an advantage as early as possible. Uh, so as a big man, try to get away from your man protect the basketball, uh, read the defender of the guard. And as a guard, before you get to the handoff, try to already have a small advantage uh, that the defender of yours doesn't interfere with the handoff or, or gets a hand on the, on the ball uh, and gets the, gets the big man in, in trouble. And then, of course, also read if, the, if your defender uh, wants to shortcut and go under the, the handoff screen, then go in a quick re-screen action. If the, the guard chases you, then just keep attacking and uh, again, here we go. Keep the advantage alive. It's always the same thing. It's, as I said, it's very simple. Word of the day for offense and defense, right? One's trying to, <laughs> trying to create it and the other one's trying to counter the advantage. Uh, the Absolutely. other thing I, we have to come back to, because you mentioned it a number of times, is the hammer, the two side, to attack mm -hmm. a two side particularly. Can you talk about some of the things that you like out of the hammer actions? Well, it, it gives the the ball handler or the guy with the ball, usually it's it's uh, in the moment you either set a screen, you run, run a ball screen action against the flat hatch defense usually, um, that you keep the two-man side defensively busy. You avoid that the defense can concentrate on the ball screen action and stunt in too much. So you want to keep them busy. Um, you can create a shot um, for, for a good shooter because the whole focus of, of the offense, of the defense um, might be, on that pick and roll action or on a driving action. A lot of times you use a, a, a hard drive to the baseline um, to, to set that hammer action on the, on the weak side. So um, I think the timing is crucial now that, that you, uh, you set the screen in the, in the right moment. Uh, and then of course, to make the decision who sets the screen and who's the receiver on the receiving end. Uh, and in that case, of course, it makes sense if you get the better shooter uh, to, to get the shot and, and the screener to be the, the less effective shooter or be the better rebounder, better screener or whatever. It sounds very, very simple and profane, but uh, that, that's basketball. And again, it's, it's, it's really simple. Coach, this has been amazing. I mean, I, again, I said this earlier, I could talk to you all day about basketball. And uh, as you said, we wish we were on the court because obviously it brings a better visual example for everyone, but uh, so many coaches can take so much away from this. And uh, thank you for sharing the game with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was, was a lot of fun, uh, very abstract uh, at times. So I hope everybody could, could imagine what's going on in my, my strange brain. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I hope everybody could pick a little bit out of it. I had a lot of fun and it was great talking to you since you obviously are an expert. So uh, it's always, always fun to, to speak basketball to someone who understands.